This is an, an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Good afternoon. My name is Vincent Manancourt. I am a reporter in the tech team at Politico, and you're watching Politico Live, the live extension of Politico's unbiased journalism. Thank you for being with us online. This week, it looks like we'll take a step closer to rebooting US-EU data transfers. The European Commission is expected to publish its assessment of the US data protection framework after President Joe Biden's executive order in October. That order aims to address concerns of overreach by US security and intelligence agencies raised by the EU's top judicial authority, the European Court of Justice. But will it be, en will it be enough? We will be discussing this and more with the Commissioner for EU Justice, Didier Reinders, and our panelists. But first things first, we have some housekeeping remarks. I would like to thank our partner, the Centre for Information Policy Leadership, for making this event possible. Thank our audience for joining us online. We would like to make this event as interactive as possible. You can participate by tweeting about it at Live Politico and ask questions via the Slido app using hashtag Politico data flows. We'll be prioritizing questions which are sent with the name and organization so it's transparent for our viewers and interviewees. You can already share your thoughts and answer the following poll presented by Sipil. How would a renewed legal challenge affect your organization's decision to rely on the new framework? We'll look at the results at the end of our event. Now, before we get started, we'll he hear some opening remarks from our partner, Boyana Bellamy, the president of CIPL. Um, Boyana, over to you. Thank you very much, Vincent, and good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Boyana, this is Boyana Bellamy. I'm president of Center for Information Policy Leadership. Very delighted to welcome everybody for this really important discussion. And thank you very much, Politico, for partnering with us uh, and enabling um, uh, this um, uh, fantastic panel. And of course, to Commissioner Reinders, who has not only given his time and leadership, but really has participated personally in the Herculean effort in achieving this um, important transatlantic uh, data uh, framework. Now, um, uh, it is perfect timing, as Vincent says, uh, because we have got, hopefully, this week, uh, we will have a draft adequacy decision as it regards this framework. But also, I also want to remind everybody that this week in the OECD, the ministers are meeting together to hopefully also um, publish a declaration on the agreed new principles for trusted government access to data. Now, let's talk first of all why this deal is a game changer, why I think this deal matters and why it is different. Um, US has in fact codified the existing requirements, uh, practices, uh, when it comes to governmental access to data, but they've also agreed to implement a whole array of new rules, policies, procedures, and safeguards when it comes to government access to data and also delivering the effective mechanism. Um, it is groundbreaking, in my opinion, for, for really several reasons. First of all, uh, this deal and the executive order articulates in a very familiar to European lawyers and judges way, the limitations and parameters under which government and national security can conduct um, surveillance activities very much in line with the European uh, concepts of necessity and proportionality. Um, and in fact, you know, there is a whole section that talks about the, the objectives of surveillance that have to be fulfilled, the prohibitions that have to be avoided, and the criteria that have to be taken into account to, to ensure there is that proportionality and necessity principles. Um, secondly, it also creates a very interesting novel multi-layered 
and also independent and binding redress mechanisms for individuals against the decisions of the surveillance authorities. And this is also novel and it's different. And I really very much look forward to hearing from the experts on our panel um, more details about how these two really uh, drastically change the, 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 the situation today. Uh, but also importantly, this new deal um, uh, reflects and meets both the requirements of the EU law on one side and the US law on the other side. I mean, we have to consider that we are not drafting rules in vacuum. They have to respect and respond to constitutional circumstances of both legal regimes, which are not the same, albeit they share the same democratic values, the same rule of law. So if you think about this really in an analogy, it's a little bit like, um, you know, we would all love to have a single electric plug that works on both sides but that, that's not there and will never be there. So we have to look at the right adapter that enables us to plug European or US devices into each other's uh, currents, right? So that's really what we are looking for, interoperable and very good adapter. And then final point is that it's groundbreaking this deal because it also introduces reciprocity in terms of um, the US has also had to make determination whether any other country will actually benefit from this new redress mechanism because it provides also uh, appropriate protections for US citizens when it comes to government access to data. Now, um, I think for me, what is really important is that this deal comes at a right moment and right time. Timing is everything in the world, right? And we are seeing today a real shift and the new momentum gathering in terms of global data flows. And that reflects the fact that we all need better consistency. We need better reliability of transfer mechanisms. So what are some of these, some of these other uh, key developments? First of all, I've mentioned briefly OECD work where for the first time, for the first time, OECD has taken on, taken on this really important topic of how to create some new trusted principles for governmental access to data among like-minded like countries of the OECD. And we are expecting the ministerial declaration this week. Um, equally, G7 group of developed countries has uh, endorsed and taken on board the topic of data free flows with trust that has been pioneered and lead, you know, under Japan's leadership. And this is going to be also key discussion at this year's G7 meetings, including the G7 uh, Data Protection Authorities Group that is meeting on the site. Um, also, there is a larger recognition globally that really the data localization doesn't really work because it harms people, it harms society, it harms um, uh, our businesses as well. And we do need a better global, global system. So it is interesting to know that there are some attempts to create a new global multilateral system, perhaps perhaps uh, based on the current APEC rules, but the privacy rules that have become now global and that could be upgraded to, to provide for that interoperability and bridging with Europe and the other countries as well. So let's go back quickly to this deal and just maybe share some of my thoughts um, before we go into the panel. Um, I mean, my feeling is that the expectation of those who are you know, in the know and experts uh, in privacy and constitutional matters and the European uh, law, as well as the US law, is that this agreement will and must absolutely sustain any legal challenges. Um, and it is really great to see some positive first reactions from data protection authorities um, and the European data protection supervisor as well. And it is important. These voices are very important. And so what, I'm, what I'd like to, us to do is that when we all, all of us, from privacy practitioners to NGOs, to commission, to institutions, um, the countries, EU countries, look and judge this deal. We should really have a look at four things. First of all, have a look at the outcomes. Outcomes do matter, right? What are the outcomes that this is now created for individuals in the EU, EU citizens? Do they have the same protection against government surveillance in the US like they would have in the US, in, in the EU, right? And, and, and these outcomes clearly are not different anymore, right? That really is important. And to me, this matters hugely. Outcome-based rules and outcomes, outcomes are hugely important. It's not theoretical discussion, it's actually what matters and what happens on the ground for people and for their privacy protection. 
The secondly, second point is really about objectives, right? Um, so what are the objectives? What serves the best interest of people and the society, democratic society today? And in my opinion, the objective is here to provide and ensure reasonable accountability-based mitigations and system um, for um, mitigating risks while preserving the benefits of data flows. And let's be totally clear, there is no such thing as risk-free data flow, right? Um, and in fact, there is no such thing as risk-free data processing and data sharing, even within the same country, even within the EU. And that's why we have got risk-based laws, because that enables us to keep our laws current while we are adapting to the new world, right? And so it's very important that we actually interpret the mechanisms as well as rules of data flows in a risk-based uh, uh, way, which is also enabled through our concepts of fairness and proportionality, which are very much part of our uh, legal system. And so really, it's a very broad um, a range of objective uh, interests, rights, and benefits that are associated with data transfers today. And that's really what we are trying to protect, protect as well as ensure that there are no risks. Uh, my third consideration is the fact that, you know, no matter what we do, what we say, data is going to be flowing globally. It's flowing, it is flowing today, or are flowing today, depending on your grammar, and they will continue to do so, right? So what we need to do is inject a real dose of pragmatism and re reasonableness in the way we discuss uh, our data flows governance today, right? Um, and that means that both in this agreement, but also in respect of data flows to other countries, in respect to data flow, uh, uh, other, other mechanisms for data flows and future mechanisms for data flows. You all know why data must flow. It must flow because we all want to benefit uh, from scientific, educational, health and societal progress that data flows bring to enable actually countries to participate uh, in a fair and just way in this new digital transformation from global north to global south to global east to global west um, to, to enable companies um, and organizations, public sector as well, to um, ensure their business interest, um, for example, use of data for fraud prevention, security, uh, anti-money laundering, uh, commercial crime, um, and of course, in protection of data as well, security and cyber. Um, and of course, to 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 participate in, in in this economy and use huge amounts of online products. Um, McKinsey all the time yearly publishes an interesting research where they look at the impact of data flows. And while data flows are growing, the trade in services and goods is declining. There is a deglobalization in everything but data flows. And McKinsey says again and again, 86% of companies of SMEs and startups are born global and they, they absolutely rely on data flows. And that's why we need to enable them. And then my final consideration, as we think about uh, the, uh, the data flow mechanism, is that um, indeed companies have been spending huge amounts of effort, time and resources on dealing with data flows. And really, I, as, as a passionate practitioner, would like to see these resources now move into what I think really matters to people. And that is ensuring that our um, technology products, services are developed with privacy in mind, privacy by design, that companies conduct privacy risk assessments, that they build responsible AI and responsible data practices, that they've got the right governance, right people, tools in place, um, including privacy enhancing technologies. That is really what matters. And that's what I would like to see uh, companies really spend their time on. So with that, I'm going to finish my um, introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much again for this great opportunity. I hugely look forward to listening to this conversation between Vincent and our amazing panelists who were in the trenches creating this deal and who are also experts in uh, different questions on governmental access to data. Over to you, Vincent. Thank you, Bayana. And uh, just to be fully transparent with our, with our viewers um, who might not be as familiar with your organization, uh, I'd just like to remark that, that Meta is a member of CIPL um, and Meta is obviously the, the company at the centre of this uh, data transfers case. Now, good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Um, obviously, we're here to talk about data flows, and there's there's, there's so much to talk about. Uh, but as a journalist, it would be remiss of me 
Um, not to ask you about the biggest story in Brussels today, which is the allegations of corruption involving uh, the European Parliament and the state of Qatar. What, what was your reaction when you heard the news? But we need to continue to work on uh, the rule of law, the implementation of the rule of law. I mean, uh, an independent justice system, and you have seen it in this case in Belgium, we have an independent justice system doing the job, but also the fight against corruption, the media pluralism, and we are doing that at the level of the member state, but it's also very important to do that at the level of the European institutions. But for the moment, we are following uh, investigations organized by an independent justice system in one of the member states here in Brussels. Mm -hmm. So we'll uh, see what uh, could be or should be the reaction of the European Parliament. I'm sure that it's very important to uh, strengthen the rules, maybe to protect better mm -hmm. uh, the situation and certainly to fight better against corruption and about all the conflict of interest or all the kind of mm -hmm. different influence on the parliament, like on all the institutions. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are plans in the works for an independent EU ethics body, and I think uh, your colleague, um, EU VP, Vice President Vera Jourova, has said that perhaps this body will you know, lack, lack a bit of teeth. Do you think, in light of this, that we, you, knew, you, knew, you need to strengthen that proposal? And but the... we, we have made some progress, if I may, in my portfolio, we have put into place the European Public Prosecutor Office. So now it's possible also about the European institutions to start investigations from the European level with real prosecutors. But if you look to the reality of the last weekend, uh, in fact, it's possible for the national justice system also to do the job. And if we have so many discussions now, it's due to the fact that we have, seems to be, an efficient functioning mm -hmm. of an uh, independent justice system in one member state acting also in the European institution. And of course we need to reinforce all the time because I'm more in charge to reinforce the rule of law in the member states. But again, there are a lot of things to do at the level of the European institutions. We have started with the European Public Prosecutor Office. It's a new uh, capacity to investigate uh, also about the protection of the financial interests of the uh, uh, European Union. But I'm sure that there are also some internal rules in the different institutions. We have some rules in the Commission. You know that we have a lot of processes mm -hmm. in the Commission. And it's important to continue to see if it's possible to have better rules also in the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this, uh, this scandal so far is focused on the Parliament. Have you heard any rumours of similar you know, people being approached in the Commission by, by Qatari or you know, any I other? I don't have any information, but also about the actual investigations. You know, I'm Commissioner for Justice, but for the moment what we have, it's an inquiry, it's an investigation by some prosecutors and one uh, judge in Belgium. So we are uh, mm -hmm. listening all the comments we are reading the press, but we don't receive more concrete information. For the moment, and Hoyne... Does, does it concern have... you, though? Does it concern no, you I... that this, this could be a possibility? Oh, it's all the time a possibility, like in the member states, like in all the institutions. For the moment, we have received information about the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. Turning now to data flows, yeah. which is the, the focus of today's discussion. Um, the Commission is now preparing its draft adequacy decision uh, following the US executive order. Uh, the main question that I think everyone will have is, you know, why this time? Why will it work this time when the last two adequacy decisions, or privacy shield and safe harbour, as they were called, they were struck down at the European Court of Justice? Well, it's a long process, but maybe to react to what I've uh, listened from uh, the first intervention, I want to say that we have three main objectives in the Commission and certainly in this mandate. First of all, is to enforce better the GDPR. It's all internal uh, system. Uh, we have internal rules and we try to enforce better year after year and you have seen that we have asked to the member states to give more resource to uh, data protection authorities. We have asked to the data protection authorities to go to the end of very complex uh, investigations and we have seen huge fines, now more than 1.5 billion euros of fines uh, are important to some different companies and we'll continue to work more and more with cross-border situations and with better rules at the national level to enforce better the GDPR. That's the first element. Then, of course, we try to have an influence with our GDPR uh, uh, at, in the international level. And we have seen that in, on the five continents now, there are more and more countries taking the same kind of rules that we have taken with the GDPR. Not exactly the same, of course, but to give the same kind of protection. And I've listened to the discussion that we have in the OECD, but also in other fora, and all the time, it's uh, with the real influence of the GDPR. Mm -hmm. It's become to be an international standard. It's very important. Maybe one day we'll have a sort of privacy law mm -hmm. at the federal level of the US. For the moment, there are some uh, privacy laws at the state level in the US, mm -hmm. but not yet at the federal level. And then, of course, 
we try to be sure that uh, when uh, uh, we organize the data flows, the protection given to the open citizen is traveling with the data. And it's the reason why it was possible to take an adequacy decision about Japan. Mm -hmm. And we have a huge data flows with Japan, with UK after the Brexit. We took two decisions and very recently with South Korea. So why not with the US? And so I've started uh, at the beginning of my mandate in the end of 19 to discuss with my US counterpart about a possible decision of the Court of Justice about the Privacy Shield. Mm -hmm. Then after the decision in July 2020, mm -hmm. we have started to negotiate. And what is very important, uh, it's to say that what we have tried in more than one year, negotiations with the Trade Secretary, Gino Raimondo, and with the Attorney General, Mel Garland, was to say how it's possible to implement the requirement of the Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. Is our highest jurisdiction mm -hmm. in Europe, like the Supreme Court in the US, so we need to implement. And in fact, we had um, two main um, objectives. First of all, how it's possible to ask to the intelligence community in the US to have full respect for the two principles of necessity and proportionality when they decide to have an access to uh, personal data. And then how it's possible to give free of charge for all the European citizens an access to a review. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know that the, the main point maybe for the Court of Justice was that, a real review before a court. And we have discussed at length about that to be sure that it's possible to have a two-layer system mm -hmm. with a real uh, possibility for the uh, privacy uh, a civil liberty official in the US to organize the oversight on the intelligence community. And the intelligence community will have to change their rules. They are working on it. And then after that, to give to the European citizen an access to a court. Mm -hmm. There were the two main issues and that took one year Mm -hmm. to go to an agreement at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, since the beginning of this year, we have discussed with the US to have a correct translation yes. of such an agreement in principle in the text. So the executive order and different implementing text. Can I put some specific criticisms to you that have uh, emerged from civil society and from some of the regulators uh, already? And the first being that the executive order um, still maintains um, bulk surveillance, uh, bulk access. Um, and secondly, the, the redress mechanism um, also has some issues, according to, to, to you know, the critics, um, including around its independence. Um, so this is, this is a body that is set up essentially within the executive. Uh, you know, arguably, um, the, the requirements for this to be an independent judicial uh, redress mechanism aren't met. How, how, are you, how are you confident that those requirements but, have been met? First of all, because you spoke about the oversight on the intelligence community, in fact, mm -hmm. it's possible to be sure that there's a real uh, of respect for the two principles, necessity and proportionality. Mm -hmm. I want to say that we have the same concern in Europe. You know that in the GDPR, there is an exception for national security issues. But if it's used by member states, it must be used with a full respect for the two principles. So we try to ask the same to the uh, US authorities. And it's the reason why with the PICLOP, so such an mm -hmm. independent agency in charge of the uh, privacy civil liberty, we have uh, discussed with the, the chair of the PICLOP to say how it's possible to intensify the role of such an independent agency on the intelligence community in the US to be sure there's an oversight mm -hmm. and an oversight with an annual report not only to receive the complaints of course from mm -hmm. European citizens but also to come with a real analysis of the situation in the intelligence community and I said for the moment all the intelligence agencies are working on um, a modification of their internal rules to comply with the new rules that we have put into place in discussion with uh, the US authorities. The second element is true is the judicial review. It's an executive order with the same uh, capacity to be implemented than a law. And uh, we have tried to work on all the safeguards. How is possible to be sure that we have an independent body mm -hmm. with judges in the body, with some rules about the uh, appointment, the dismissal of the judges. Again, the private civil liberty uh, officer will have a role to play in mm -hmm. such a process, an independent agency. And we have tried to see how it's possible to have real, real access to uh, the content of the situation for the European citizens. And there are different rules to do that. But 
To make a comparison, mm -hmm. in the privacy shield that I have received from the previous commission, and unfortunately it was impossible uh, to uh, organize with a validation with the Court of Justice, we had an ombudsperson in the State Department. It's totally different if you look to a numbered person in the State Department or a real court that we have tried to organize now. And so with the two layers of review and redress, I'm sure that we have a solid basis. But I want to be clear because you spoke about some uh, civil society organizations and some reactions. I'm sure that we will have to go back to the Court of Justice. The only one difference that I'm just hoping that it's possible to have a positive decision of the Court of Justice, mm -hmm. because we will have to prove that we have a solid, a robust base. We don't ask to the partners to implement the same privacy law that we have in Europe. Mm -hmm. And is the reason why I've started to say that we have an adequacy decision about Japan, about UK, about South Korea, to give the two, three main examples in the last months and years. Of course, they don't have exactly the same system. They have the same level of protection. And it's what we have tried to do with the US colleagues. So to us to have a full respect for the requirement of the Court of Justice mm -hmm. and to implement the same level of protection. But of course, we'll have a challenge before the Court of Justice. I'm sure of that, that we'll have some people trying. Can, if you, I can, may... you, can you give a guarantee today that, that they will uphold, it will if withstand go, that legal if challenge? If you go to justice, you don't have any possible guarantee, but I'm quite confident because we have a robust Could you, could you put a number on that? Out of 10, how confident are you? Oh, I'm optimistic by nature, but also without that, I would say seven or eight, because we are very far in a very robust system. And again, of course, if you ask to have exactly the same mechanism, than in the GDPR and in the open system. It's not the case. We don't ask, but also in the rest of the world, to have the exact uh, situation that we have in Europe. But they have the same level of protection. And there we are very far with the new system, with a robust system. But I want also to say what will be maybe important to all the, the people speaking about that is maybe to try the new system. You know that in the near future, mm -hmm. we'll have to work at your level uh, to come with a, maybe in the next hours or days with a draft adequacy decision. Mm -hmm. We'll have to discuss that with the data protection authorities, the uh, mm -hmm. European Data Protection Board, with the member states, because we need to receive the green light of the member yeah. states. We'll have a scrutiny for the parliament before to go, maybe before the summer next year, mm -hmm. three years after the decision of the Court of Justice, to have a final decision. But at the same moment, it's needed for the US colleagues to work also, mm -hmm. to change the rules in the intelligence community, mm -hmm. the, all the agencies, but also to put into place the review court, the appointment of the judge and the mechanism that it's needed mm -hmm. to, to put into place. But at the, after that, if I have a request mm -hmm. to all the people saying something about the system, please mm -hmm. test the system. If you have some doubts about the efficiency, please go to uh, uh, the um, mm -hmm. pri private uh, civil liberty officer or try to go to the review call yeah. before to say that it's inefficient. Because it was maybe a problem in the past, mm -hmm. no try of the US yeah. system. Now we have a solid one, so please try the US system uh, and test it. Can I, can I also ask about timeline here? Because we said in the past that it takes around six months from this, this point, let's say the draft decisions come this week. Is it six months from now that we'll have a final decision? Is that what you expect? I'm all, you, all, all the time very prudent because I <laughs> know the complexity of all the procedures, but normally it's that. It's around mm -hmm. six months. I will say before the next summer, mm -hmm. it must be possible to go to the end of the process. So mm -hmm. an opinion of the DPB, a green light from the comitology, so the member mm -hmm. states, all the member states, a scrutiny from the parliament before to go to a final decision in the commission. But that means that we will have a decision maybe before July next year, uh, three years after the decision of the Court of Justice. Yeah. And I've started to discuss in December 19 a, about a possible decision of the Court of Justice. So yeah. we took the time. It's not just a, a decision just to adapt very quickly yeah. to the situation. We have discussed at length with our counterpart. And the main issue was to understand better on both sides that we need to implement the requirement of the court. I have had many discussions with some uh, mm. legal services in the commission, outside, some experts, to say what are the main requirements of the court. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as the two layers 
mm -hmm. of redress. Now we have taken into account the situation uh, with the um, decision of the Court of Justice. And uh, I've tried to, uh, uh, to discuss with the uh, US authorities, maybe it will be important to explain better in Europe Mm -hmm. what the system is. I mentioned the oversight on the intelligence community. It's not so well known in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we need maybe to explain better mm -hmm. what is the system and how it was possible to reinforce the system. We have five minutes left. I, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit. You mentioned there you, you spent three years, essentially more than three years, on this decision. Yeah. And some of the criticisms, especially from the US, is that all this focus, all this brain power is going into assessing the US when there's, there's China on the other side of the world that, that arguably poses a much greater threat um, to, to our privacy. Is, is that a concern to you? Is data transfers to China a concern for you? It's a concern with all, uh, all over the world, but we try to come to an adequacy adequacy decision when we are sure that, like I said, that the protection is traveling with the data. So we don't have adequacy decision with China, of course. And uh, of course, we will try also to work with like-minded partners, not only uh, to have bilateral decisions. At the end, it's a decision of the Commission to recognize the system. And I said, I've given some examples. We have a set of 15, around 15 uh, adequacy decisions with different partners in the world. But we try also to convince different partners in the G7 uh, with the proposal of the former Jap Japanese Prime Minister, Mr. <coughs> Abe, uh, and with maybe the discussion in the OECD, that it's important to try to build a robust system at the international level. But for the European Union, if we are doing that, it will be with a full respect for all, uh, for all level of protection, of course. We don't want to go down with yeah. the level of protection. But again, uh, when we are going to an adequacy decision, it's because we have a full trust mm -hmm. in, the, the, in the system. And so I will say for the moment, we don't discuss with China about a possible adequacy decision. Mm -hmm. Um, you've, you've mentioned the OECD there. That there is the, the ministerial meeting yep. uh, this week where it's expected to, to announce this declaration on um, a framework uh, around data access by governments um, within the OECD members. Are you happy with the outcome? Of well, that? First of all, I'm happy that it's possible to have such a discussion. It's quite recent huh, because in the past it was not so evident. And so to fix some minimum standards. But we want to be very clear. We don't want to go to an adequacy decision with one partner mm -hmm. if we don't have the same level of protection than in Europe. So it's the reason why it will be very important to have a, a set of rules for all the different partners with an engagement to uh, mm -hmm. put that into place, into force. But if we want to organize a bilateral relation, it will be all the time with an analyze of the system in comparison with all level of protection. And again, when I'm looking back to the discussion that we have had with the US, I've said from the beginning, of course, it's not an obligation to have a privacy law at the federal level, mm -hmm. but that will help. So I'm hoping that with the new Congress, we will see, mm -hmm. it will be possible maybe to move in a bipartisan new legislation about the privacy law. Because I've seen the last years an evolution during those discussions in the US about that. I said different legislation at the state level, mm -hmm. so a risk of fragmentation and the obligation to uh, implement different legislations in different member states, like uh, different states, like we have had with the member states at the EU level. And then more and more reactions in the civil society organization, but more in general in the society, mm -hmm. about a real need for a protection. Maybe not exactly the same than in Europe, but the same kind of a movement. If it's possible to do that, of course it will be a, a reinforcement of all discussions about the, the protection that we have had with the US counterpart. Mm -hmm. And how do you envisage this document being used and being useful, this, the OECD document, sorry, in the future? It, will it form the basis of adequacy decisions or um, perhaps provide some support uh, in, a, in a potential legal challenge against... Well, it will be US. a first level of protection. So, of course, if it's possible to have a correct implementation in all the different participants, it will be fine because it's a first level of protection. To have an adequacy decision, all the time we are looking to all level of protection, so the GDPR and the rules mm -hmm. into place in Europe. But uh, it's also possible to exchange data without an adequacy decision. You know that we have modernized the standard contractual clause. Mm -hmm. And so if you are using the standard contractual clauses and you are working with a country where it's possible to implement the OECD rules, it will be a certain level of protection. You need maybe to be more cautious 
because you don't have an adequacy decision. But my, my feeling is that it's a first step. If we have such a declaration, is the reason why I said I'm happy with such a declaration, because it's a first step and maybe we'll increase the protection year after year and maybe to go to the same kind of level of protection that we have put into place in Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, Commissioner Reinders. You, you gave it seven or eight out of ten if it ever comes to a legal challenge, which it undoubtedly will. Um, thank you very much. And it's now my pleasure to welcome our next panellists, um, where we'll explore these topics in more depth. First up, there's Bruno Gencarelli, who is the Deputy Director for Fundamental Rights and the Rule of Law at DG Just at the European Commission, who's been um, leading the work on the European side uh, on this decision. Uh, we have Alex Greenstein, who's the director of the Privacy Shield, which was the, um, the forerunner uh, deal to the, to the current uh, draft decision uh, on EU-US data transfers. He's from the U US Department of Commerce. Um, hi, Alex. And then we have a second Alex, <laughs> which makes it um, helpful for me as the moderator, <laughs> Alex Joel, uh, who's a scholar in residence and adjunct, adjunct professor at the Washington College of Law, uh, and I believe was also quite heavily involved in the OECD um, declaration that me and uh, the commissioner were just talking about. Um, so thank you, uh, the three of you, for coming here. Uh, the commissioner uh, gave the, the, the legal withstandability, uh, to, to coin a, a word, of the, um, the draft decision, a seven or eight out of ten. Um, do you think that's uh, overly optimistic? Bruno, you can go first. Uh, thank you. And uh, first, um, hi everybody, and uh, very pleased to be, to be here. Um, what the Commissioner explained, and, uh, uh, and that was really at the center of this negotiation, is that we, with, with the judgment of the court that invalidated the privacy shield, we uh, received a mandate from the court with uh, clear requirements when it comes to uh, necessity and proportionality, so in which situation, to which extent, and to what extent uh, data can be collected for national security uh, reasons, and, uh, and, uh, and requirements as regards uh, redress and the possibility to, to invoke uh, those safeguards uh, before a, a, a court, before tribunal. And uh, we, we believe that uh, what we have developed uh, uh, in those negotiations uh, meets uh, these, these requirements. As the Commissioner has explained, we have now, that's very different from uh, uh, what was uh, existing uh, at the moment of the uh, adoption of the privacy shield. We have now binding and enforceable safeguards uh, on uh, reflect the requirements of necessity and proportionality, and, do, and these safeguards uh, uh, can be invoked uh, uh, by Europeans uh, uh, before a uh, tribunal that uh, has uh, the independence, the impartiality, the binding powers, uh, the remedial powers uh, that are required uh, by, by our court of justice, by the highest court. And as the, the court commissioner has also explained, the challenge here was uh, to uh, fulfill the requirements of the highest courts. That's our obligation, that's our duty, uh, and at the same time, finding a system that uh, works, that is workable, and therefore works uh, in the U.S., uh, uh, within the parameters of the U.S. system, within the constitutional parameters of the U.S. system, and that's, for instance, why we have uh, developed uh, such and created and established such a, such a tribunal. Mm -hmm. I guess we come back to that uh, aspect. Yeah. Can, can I drill into a few things that you've uh, said there, particularly around the, the legal terminology there of necessary and proportionate, which uh, was seen as quite a big step forward because these are fundamentally European legal concepts rather than US legal concepts. Uh, but then the, the question that, that some have is, what does this actually mean in, in US law? And does it, does it have the same standard uh, as it does under US law? And, and I, I'm asking you, Bruno, but please feel free to come in um, other, to our other panelists. First, I don't think they are European concepts. Uh, they are actually international concepts uh, that are uh, um, that govern uh, that balancing that often uh, uh, you're faced with between different rights, different con different considerations. Could be privacy, could be freedom of speech, uh, could be national security, uh, or other important uh, considerations. And, uh, and, and therefore, I think that's also why I think we were uh, able to also work uh, uh, on this principle. 
And, and second, uh, what I think is important when you when you look at the executive order, so the executive order doesn't only uh, mention this principle. I'm hearing sometimes that uh, uh, some say, you know, the executive order sort of uh, pays uh, lip services to this principle. The executive order actually spells out uh, what necessity and proportionality mean and uh, how they should be reflected operationally uh, um, in uh, how the intelligence agency uh, um, determine whether to collect data and to what extent to collect data. So uh, uh, to give a, an example, uh, when uh, addressing the question of proportionality, therefore that, that balancing exercise between a, uh, a measures of collection of data for national security reason and uh, the interference that that measure can have uh, with the right to privacy. The executive order spells out the factors that have to be uh, considered, uh, taken into account uh, when making that decision. And uh, what do you see uh, amongst the two? What kind of factors do you find in the executive orders? Uh, the, 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 the nature of the threat, the seriousness of the threat, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, uh, foreseeable impact on, on, on the individual, the nature of the data, whether this is sensitive data or not, um, and the duration of the collection. So those are the factors that if you then open any judgment of the uh, European Court of Justice, of the European uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Court, uh, the Strasbourg Court, of our constitutional courts, you will find the same type of factors, actually, to a very uh, large extent, identical factors when, when uh, uh, making that determination. Mm -hmm. and, and that's important because those are the factors that will be applied uh, by the intelligence agencies in those rules the Commissioner has uh, mentioned the implementing rules that each intelligence agency will have to adopt in the US. And those will also be the factors uh, that uh, the uh, redress mechanism and the Data Protection Review Court will have to consider when uh, handling, uh, uh, adjudicating uh, a, a complaint coming from a European. Uh, thanks, Bruno. Just uh, bringing some, some other uh, speakers to this conversation. Alex, Alex Greenstein. Um, the, a question I asked the commissioner is why will it be different this time? And, and perhaps, you know, Bruno there focused on the necessary and proportionality, legal terminology. The other main criticism is, is around the, the, the independence of the, um, the, the redress mechanism. Um, so, you know, if, if, you're, if you're speaking to um, many other listeners will be companies that, that rely on US-EU data transfers and will be perhaps looking to rely on this legal mechanism, why should they have confidence in, in this, this new deal? No, certainly. Thank you for having me here. Um, it's good to be here and we're definitely very glad to sort of be working with the commission on um, moving this forward. I would say like in a one distinction I'd like to make sort of is that about why this is different and why we are more optimistic about sort of our um, the, uh, the stability of this framework is that when we negotiated Privacy Shield, we were utilizing and um, it was done on the basis of Presidential Policy Directive 28, which was a set of groundbreaking reforms about sort of how the U.S. did um, surveillance and what we did and didn't do in terms of um, protecting the privacy of um, individuals and in particular sort of Europeans. Um, but that was done a little bit sort of in a vacuum in this situation as we've negotiated the data privacy framework um we were able to do it in full knowledge of the um, court's decision in the schrems 2 case which did give us some fairly detailed guidance about what the decision about what the conditions were that were uh, what the concerns were and what the united states would need to do in order to set up a framework that would be uh, meet the standards of the court. And so certainly on necessity and proportionality, we were able to, or the approach that we took was sort of to describe sort of how we would apply those terms. And yeah, they aren't just European terms. They are sort of, yeah, internationally familiar concepts um, that have meaning in sort of a, a number of sort of legal systems, including the United States. And so I think we were able to address that. And as Bruno quite ably um, described, I mean, the criteria are quite, um, similar to those that are sort of applied in Europe. In terms of the redress mechanism, certainly like I know the ombudsperson is 
totally different from sort of what we've done in terms of setting up the data privacy review court. And I think this really is an example of us thinking creatively and sort of working to be as forward leaning as possible within the um, limitations of sort of the US Constitution in order to offer sort of independent and binding redress. And so um, certainly I think that there are a great deal. The court is going to be independent and sort of separate from um, the administration and the executive order provides strong protections for the independence of the court and uh, protects sort of the judges from uh, removal and undue influence and things of that sort. And then also I mean, it does sort of the executive order says that sort of the decisions must be complied with and are binding. And so that um, I think makes this substantially different from the ombudsperson and uh, fully addresses the concerns and um, raise in the Schrems 2 decision. Mm -hmm. um, Alex Joel, I'll bring you in here, um, especially around the um, I was just reading the uh, the response by the Hamburg Data Protection Authority to the executive order, uh, which, and they caution, cautiously welcomed it. They, they said it was a step in the right direction, but they did say it was problematic that um, the you know the U.S. surveillance mechanism, uh, bulk surveillance, uh, it still remains largely intact. Can you, can you explain for our our viewers what exactly has changed or what will change under the executive order in that regard? Sure, and I come at this as uh, somebody who was, uh, Vincent, as you know, I was uh, involved in government for many years. I was the civil liberties protection officer when uh, PPD 28 was done and Privacy Shield, and that's the position that has some prominence in the new executive order. Um, so bulk collection is something that intelligence agencies do engage in, and that's been recognized in Europe under the European legal system. The European Court of Human Rights has recognized that uh, sometimes agencies will have to collect data in bulk. So it, it is not something that is unique to the U.S. legal system. And the question really becomes not whether uh, bulk collection as a concept is legally valid, but rather what are the protections, what are the safeguards, what are the constraints that are being placed uh, around bulk collection? And in this regard and, and in other regards, I think this executive order um, is really an impressive achievement uh, on, on, on behalf of the uh, intelligence community, as well as, of course, in the discussions they had with the European Commission. And as Alex Greenstein points out, um, one of the benefits they had in crafting this executive order was they had the guidance already from the court in terms of what was expected, something we did not really have in detail when we were uh, working on Presidential Policy Directive 28. And there are some protections that are added and that are truly new here with the bulk collection section. For example, I think one of the most uh, interesting parts is that um, uh, they have to make a determination that collection is not, I'm trying to find the exact words, um, the, the information necessary to advance a validated intelligence priority cannot reasonably be obtained by targeted collection. And then there's some additional language limitations on what the information can be used for, uh, six essentially legitimate objectives, which were the ones that had been articulated in PPD 28. Um, but they've put more, uh, a lot more meat on the bones in terms of these protections and safeguards and how they translate into action on the part of the intelligence agencies, um, really focusing in on these concepts of necessity and proportionality. And as both Alex Greenstein and Vincent have said, these are not words that have been invented out of whole cloth. They have words that have meaning. The challenge for the U.S. legal system has always been that the words, in terms of how they're used uh, in in the in Europe, um, in in some of the European legal frameworks, such as the European Court of Human Rights and and of course the European Union, um, those those legal meanings aren't don't, do not themselves appear in the U.S. legal framework in the same context. But the underlying principles are there. And so the question, the challenge really became, how do you write into a text that is going to be legally binding in the United States? Um, how do you flesh out what those legal principles mean in practice for intelligence agencies? And I think they've done a very good job uh, with this order. You had earlier asked to give a number score on the likelihood. I'm not going to give a score because the, the likelihood is going to depend on how the judges look at it. 
but within the constraints of the U.S. legal framework, this, I think, is an excellent job, uh, particularly not only fleshing out the necessity uh, and proportionality, but dealing with the constitutional constraints that we have around uh, redress and independence and binding authority. They have created a system that is independent under the U.S. legal system. The people in the system are protected from arbitrary dismissal in the performance of their duties. They are uh, they can exercise their duties fully in accordance with the law, and agencies are prohibited uh, by the order from interfering with the exercise of those duties um, in, in a in a in a in an order that has legally binding effect. So I think it's it's a um, it's an excellent attempt to meet the standard. I'm not sure I'll let you get away with not giving a score, by the way. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, Bruno, I wanted to ask you something. Obviously, the, we haven't got the draft decisions yet, but can we expect a sunset clause like, like the one we saw in the UK adequacy decision? Well, um, a, an adequacy decision is always about, the syst uh, about assessing the system at a certain point of time. And there uh, are clauses that uh, address the possibility that the system evolves and that the level of protection that at a certain point of time was considered uh, as adequate because of changes uh, is is no longer so you would certainly um uh, you would certainly uh, find uh, such uh, mechanisms uh, in the in in the draft adequacy uh, decision uh, the uk situation was slightly different because in in, in general with adequacy decision uh, we have two starting points uh, that uh, are um, quite um, distinct, far from each other, and the adequacy process is about um, uh, building uh, uh, more, more convergence. Mm. In the UK case, uh, for, for historical reasons, because uh, the UK used to be a member of the EU, the, the, the starting point was, was uh, identical, and, uh, and therefore the process was also about uh, uh, um, um, finding the right uh, mechanism, mm -hmm. the right tools, uh, address uh, uh, possible future divergence, mm -hmm. and hence of, of a sunset clause at, at the point also where the UK had announced that they were uh, uh, looking at uh, the possibility of uh, uh, reforming that, which in the meantime has happened, at least to a proposal uh, from um, uh, the UK government. The previous period. So, so I understand from your answer that the, 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 US, uh, the US adequacy decision won't have the same strength as sunset clause as the UK adequacy decision had. Is that correct? The, UK, the US adequacy decision will have a possibility yeah. of a suspension in case yeah. of changes, will have a system of uh, uh, periodic review. But, but to be clear, the UK sunset clause is, is going through the whole process from scratch again after four years. Will, will that happen with the American, with the US decision? The UK adequacy decision has a uh, date on which we will have to decide whether to mm -hmm. uh, prolong it or not. Uh, you, don't know, you, you don't need this, actually, uh, in case of problems, in case of problems it with the UK, with Japan, with Korea, or tomorrow with the US uh, when the adequacy decision uh, will be in place. If, for instance, one of these uh, key safeguards uh, we are discussing uh, right now uh, would uh, uh, be uh, removed or, or, or would be weakened, we will be able to, uh, including for emergency uh, proceeding, we will be able to, to put an end uh, to the adequacy decision uh, uh, very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's of course, uh, mm -hmm. what we hope. I, 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 yeah, I'm just asking because I, I imagine the UK might might feel a little bit hard done by if uh, that they have a, a sunset clause and the US doesn't. But anyway, mo moving on, uh, you're all I assume involved in the OECD um, process and the, the 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 declaration that is set to come out on Wednesday, I believe, uh, at a ministerial meeting in Gran Canaria. Um, what what how have you found that process and what can we expect that declaration to be and to do? So I'll, I'll, I guess I can start. Um, I've been a consultant in the process. I think it's really uh, an exciting declaration that's going to come out. Exciting for you know, I guess for us in this world. But uh, it's it's uh, it was a rigorous process uh, that that took many months to complete and uh, involved very careful discussions and deliberations 
um, trying to find commonalities in how governments uh, protect privacy and other fundamental rights uh, as they access data, personal data, in the hands of the private sector uh, for law enforcement and national security uh, purposes. And I think one of the really unique aspects of the declaration and the work that led up to it is that it involved representatives from the data protection communities, as well as from uh, national security and law enforcement uh, communities within the member countries' governments. And getting all of those perspectives together in one room, I think, was immensely valuable. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, uh, a key uh, achievement hopefully will be, well, I think necessarily it is going to be mutual understanding of how uh, governments share um, common principles and approaches, even as the details of their legal frameworks differ a lot. And I, this sort of ties back to something the commissioner was emphasizing in your interview with them, which uh, I think is uh, really important, um, which is that we're not seeking to find one specific detailed piece of legislation that applies to each country in exactly the same way. Each country has uh, its own unique legal framework. It's been driven, uh, and, and particularly in the national security arena, focusing on how do countries, how does a democracy empower and authorize its agencies to protect the nation's security, while at the same time constraining those agencies to make sure they don't go too far and themselves become a threat to, to the nation. So you have to both authorize, empower, and but you also have to restrain, oversee, constrain. How do you do both? And governments, uh, I think democracies around the world, are trying to do both at the same time. Both are equally important. But how they do it is going to differ country by country. We're all so unique and have our own different legal frameworks. And finding that path, finding the bridge between those legal frameworks is absolutely essential. And, and the, the concept that I really appreciate in EU law is this idea of essential equivalence. And as the commissioner was saying, it doesn't have to be identical. Mm -hmm. um, it can't be identical, but it does have to be essentially equivalent. It does have to provide uh, that certain level of protection. So I think the uh, uh, how I see the OECD work is, is it helps inform all of us in terms of figuring out how do each how does each country drive toward the same goals uh, along the different paths that they have in their governments. Mm -hmm. Um, going back to a question that I asked the, the commissioner around China, how, how much was China a factor in, a driver in these discussions with the OECD in terms of, uh, you know, forming some kind of framework that, that essentially cuts China out? So uh, I, I'm back, I, I'd let the other participants answer. And um, I, I will say that a, that a purpose of this effort all along, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that the folks felt it was so important to do this was to distinguish um, how like-minded democracies uh, handle this as distinct from uh, countries that don't operate under the same principle. So it was really trying to draw um, that distinction. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. I, I can only agree. Uh, I think the significance of this um, OECD uh, work is, is, is twofold. For, first, it, it shows that the this question around, this questions around uh, uh, the relevance of, of these questions around uh, government access uh, go well beyond uh, the EU US relation, transatlantic relationship. Uh, they, they have been recognized by all the OECD members as, as an important issue. Uh, first, uh, uh, for, the, for the reason that uh, Joel was, was explaining, that uh, uh, OECD countries and many other like minded countries see uh, privacy and, in particular, the way government. Uh, access data as a, a key component of the, of the dividing line between uh, uh, like-minded democracies and, and authoritarian regimes, and uh, uh, also this recognition uh, that um, when you want to ensure that the continuity of protection, which also the Commission mm -hmm. was was referred, you need really to to, to, to consider data flows um, and. Um, in their totality, in their, in their globality, and follow the data and see also what, what safeguards apply when government uh, uh, needs to, to access data that was in the first place collected and, and transferred for commercial reasons. So this idea, which is in this case, the OECD process was not launched by, by Europe or the United States, but was launched by, by Japan with the data free flow with trust concept, where trust is essentially trust uh, in how government access data. Uh, this is about uh, 
uh, uh, finding, uh, agreeing on common principles, and in this way, promoting trust in data flows and therefore uh, promoting uh, uh, facilitating trade. And that's why also uh, the OECD uh, becomes uh, a relevant organization. I think it also shows that uh, when the, the EU and the US uh, uh, come to an agreement on a certain issue, this uh, can also help the development of, of international standards. Again, has a relevance that, that goes uh, uh, beyond uh, the bilateral relationship. And I think that this is also encouraging for, for finding a solution, developing a common approaches on other issues that uh, involve a, a balance, a delicate balance between uh, rights and other important uh, considerations. So for those two reasons, we, we are very uh, happy and pleased at the, the outcome of the OECD that will be endorsed by by ministers this week. Uh, Alex Greenstein, I, I want to ask you a question quickly on the C CBPR uh, system, and then I'll go to the Slido questions, uh, which have been coming in thick and fast. Um, so the, the CBPR system is a data flows mechanism that has been recently spearheaded by the US into a global framework. It was previously existed under the uh, APEC, um, Asia Pacific trading bloc. Um, some commentators are seeing it as something of a rival to the UK adequacy system. Um, what, 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 is, what are the US ambitions for this system? I mean, I'd say sort of like, you know, the CBPRs, I mean, I wouldn't say that they're a rival to sort of like, you know, the GDPR. It's different. And I mean, certainly like, you know, while sort of Europe's like, you know, leadership on sort of data protection issues, like, you know, has um, required sort of that we like, you know, find methods for data transfers. There are a lot of other countries out there who have their own different regulatory approaches to data protection and privacy. And the CBPRs are sort of an effort to promote interoperability and help bridge these sort of different approaches to data protection and privacy. I mean, this started in sort of APEC, but there's also an increasing recognition that sort of you have countries outside of that region that um, are interested in sort of doing data transfers and have their own sort of uh, laws and policies. And so, yeah, the APEC CBPRs are sort of an effort to promote sort of interoperability uh, amongst those various laws. And I don't sort of see that in, in conflict with um, the GDPR or other transfer mechanisms. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that the, um, the Chinese company Alibaba is a signatory to the um, CBPR. Is, is, is there not some uh, a little issue there in terms of you know the US often saying that the EU focuses too much on the US and not on China, and this this the system which the US is spearheading involves a Chinese company and potentially tra uh, data transfers to China. I mean, I think that sort of like you know we're mixing sort of apples and oranges because the CBPRs are focused on commercial protections, which is different than sort of, I mean, the DPF that is um, deals with sort of and includes commitments on uh, government access to data. So I think that sort of concerns about China, well, are entirely valid, but that wouldn't be in the scope necessarily of um, the CBPR discussion. But again, I have to defer to colleagues on that because I'm not um, our um, expert on the CBPRs per se. Okay, um, I'll, Bruno, you want to say? I think you're no, on mute. I don't want to. No, no, no. Go for not it. Stand no, I mean, there's no rivalry. First of all, because uh, in the EU system, uh, you have also certification to transfer to, and uh, the EPD, the European Data Protection Board, is actually uh, uh, developing certification as, as, as a transfer to as, as we speak. And CBPR, what is called CBPR, is 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 a, is a certification scheme. But of course. Uh, to ensure that continuity of, of transfer of, of protection, sorry, a certification scheme uh, can has to be uh, has to provide for solid uh, protections, enforceable rights, and uh, that's why in the past we had some concerns uh, that the CBPR we have uh, some concerns that the CBPR can ensure that continuity of protection. But of course, if this exercise uh, around uh, uh, globalization of CBPR would, uh, would lead to a strengthening of the system, uh, we would uh, uh, certainly be interested in, in, in engaging on that as well. But I think there are actually uh, more immediate 
uh, opportunities and let me say the most uh, low hanging fruits around other transfer mechanisms that have also this uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, network effect. I'm, I'm thinking in particular of model closures. We have modernized our model closures, standard control closures in, in, in Europe, uh, um, ASEAN, the Association of, of, of Southeastern uh, countries, uh, has a system of model closures. Latin American, uh, the network of uh, Latin American data protection authorities has developed a system of model closures. And it's interesting to see that uh, all these uh, 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 model closures uh, have a lot of uh, 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 common uh, are based on, on common or common requirements, uh, and model closures are, ve are very useful. Is a very useful tool that uh, can basically uh, it's an off-the-shelf tool that can be used uh, by all companies, uh, small, uh, big, and medium, uh, by uh, bringing uh, those. Uh, standard pre-approved clauses with the legal certainty that this involves in, into into the contracts and they are very successful to yeah. number one uh, transfer mechanism for data export from the eu and we are working with asia this week everything that happened this week this week is <laughs> the 40th anniversary of the uh, asean eu partnership and in that context we will announce yeah. uh, that uh, we are developing a tool that bridge the uh, asean and the eu uh, a model process that w is will bring uh, will make uh, the, the life of, of companies active in both uh, jurisdiction uh, much easier while ensuring that continuity of protection. So I think th there are many opportunities. The same thing with our Latin American friends and and, and many other friends uh, around the world closer to home. We have seen Switzerland and the UK actually adapting uh, our model process uh, to uh, their legal system. That's. Uh, uh, something uh, in terms of uh, network effect of uh, 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 working beyond the bilateral uh, uh, dimension uh, that uh, is happening uh, right now as, as we speak. Mm. Has the EU in been invited to the CBPR forum? I, as far as I know, I don't think so. Uh, uh, but again, um, we are looking at any development uh, with interest provided uh, it it uh, it uh, uh, provides uh, the uh, necessary protections. Rights. Uh, this was not uh, yeah. This was not the case, and is not the case of CBPR today. Uh, if that would evolve in, in an interesting uh, direction, uh, we would uh, certainly uh, be be interested in that. And as as, as you know, maybe we have to uh, exclude uh, transfers based on on, on CBPR in our deposit decision. Uh, with Japan, or further transfer of data yeah. uh, uh, in the, in the um, first place. In, in Alex Greenstein, in, will the US be extending an invite to the EU into the CBPR system? Um, I'm not uh, in a position to sort of like comment. I would have to defer that to colleagues, but I know we have had discussions in the past with um, the Commission on sort of interoperability between sort of the CBPRs and sort of EU transfer mechanisms. Um, but also one point that sort of has come up, and I think that Bruno had mentioned sort of um, the standard contractual clauses. One thing that is a benefit of the data privacy framework is that it covers sort of all transfer mechanisms. And so it equally applies to and provides protections for uh, data transferred under, say, the standard contractual clauses, um, as well as um, a few under a future adequacy determination um, that the commission may uh, make for the um, data privacy framework. Mm -hmm. um, we have around uh, just over 10 minutes left. I want to quickly uh, go through some of the questions here. Um, so one that's doing particularly well uh, comes from Jim Sullivan, which uh, who I think if it's the same Jim Sullivan that I'm thinking of was um, one of the key negotiators on the uh, EU-US uh, data transfer decision. Um, he's asking, an EU adequacy decision here will alleviate organizations of having to conduct TIAs, so that's transfer impact assessments, under any valid data transfer mechanism. Is that correct? If I can answer to that, um, I think that goes to the point that um, Alex just mentioned. The safeguards we have negotiated in the year of governance access, the safeguards around necessity for proportionality redress have been negotiated so that they, when they will be uh, effectively in place on the US side, uh, uh, they will apply to any uh, transatlantic transfer, regardless of the mechanism used. So indeed, uh, standard contractual clauses, 
uh, transfers on the basis of uh, binding corporate rules, uh, etc. And that will, of course, uh, 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 significantly, uh, to use uh, the words of Jim, alleviate uh, uh, that analysis that, uh, for the moment, uh, companies uh, have to carry out. To carry out. Um, the one just came in, which I, I liked, from Simon Hania, who's the DPO of Uber. Um, what, what countries would you expect to not meet the recipro reciprocity test in the EO, aside from China? Any European countries? So, so this is the mechanism which allows the EU to um, essentially assess other countries' regimes. Which allows the US, sorry. Did I say EU? Um, which, oh, yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't think that sort of we've like, you know, prejudged sort of what um, countries would and wouldn't sort of meet the criteria. I mean, the criteria are laid out in sort of the executive order and we will apply that. And naturally, we are sort of first looking at sort of the um, European um, Union as sort of a um, qualifying state. And I have to defer to sort of our Department of Justice who is tasked with conducting that um, assessment. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question here from Anonymous, which is um, six of you have liked, and it says, does the Commission foresee any special provisions for specific types of sensitive data during transfers, for example, health data? Bruno. Yes, what the, 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 we, have, we have focused uh, so far on the uh, governance access part of, of the arrangement because that was the one that was uh, uh, important from two judgment and therefore was a deportive negotiation. But uh, the, uh, the data uh, privacy framework is, of course, first of all about the obligations that apply to companies uh, when receiving data uh, from the EU. And there, there are, there's a special regime for sensitive, sensitive data which are, which are subject to uh, a higher level of protection as it is on the EU data protection law. Mm -hmm. if, if I could just, um, just add that Bruno had earlier mentioned something on the uh, proportionality, proportionality language in the executive order, which does take into account the sensitivity of data. So I would expect that if any government access involved uh, particularly sensitive data, that that would be another factor to make sure that the access was necessary and proportionate to the legitimate intelligence objective being pursued. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if, if you want to beat on that, there's also something interesting in the executive order, which is not always uh, mentioned. We always start with necessity and proportionality, but necessity and proportionality against what? That's why we spend a lot of time in uh, trying to define what are legitimate objectives uh, for uh, 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 civilians in, in, in the area of, of, of national security and, and, and the executive order define those in uh, both uh, positive terms uh, and, um, uh, uh, espionage, sabotage, things like that, but, uh, this, but also in negative terms, saying that civilians uh, uh, should never uh, take place, for instance, uh, to discriminate uh, uh, people in the base of that's, I think, something mm -hmm. um, about sensitive. Um, Bruno, I want to ask you about uh, possible loopholes um, within this decision. Um, so what assurances do you have that US government agencies won't just access EU data by buying commercial data sets that aren't in the scope of uh, the Privacy Shield 2.0. But the, the, the principles we have uh, in the executive order uh, apply to all activities of uh, national security agencies uh, when conducting uh, uh, their task operation, uh, uh, performing their functions. Uh, we, this was also, and uh, Alex and others uh, will, will, will remember that from the negotiation, this is um, requirements of uh, necessity with proportionality are overarching uh, requirements. Uh, so there are expectations that this applies uh, across uh, the board. Uh, whenever uh, uh, data is uh, accessed, 
when when in that ecosystem scenario, the data is transferred from one company to another, uh, from one company in the EU to, to a company in the US, and is then subsequently accessed uh, by uh, uh, intelligence uh, agencies. And uh, those those requirements we have been discussing uh, uh, now for almost one hour uh, apply, um, as I said, to, to all the operations. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I want to close with a uh, perhaps a slightly more light-hearted question. Um, what's this? Ne what's this next framework going to be called? We had Safe Harbor, we had Privacy Shields. Uh, what's next? I can answer that. So, I mean, we are in the process right now of, I mean, recognizing sort of that we are making um, the data privacy framework represents sort of a significant commitment by the United States and implements sort of the. Um, commitments made by President Biden to President van der Leyen back in March. Um, we are actually updating sort of and incorporating um, the previous sort of transfer mechanism under the umbrella of the data privacy framework. So now sort of companies will be able to uh, self-certify to the EU-US data privacy framework, which will um, operate as sort of a transfer mechanism. A slightly less imaginative, imaginative name this time around, then. <laughs> yes, but it um, will still provide sort of a um, yeah strong protections, but also sort of an accessible transfer mechanism that um, will allow sort of small and medium enterprises to continue to sort of have a more um, accessible and tailored mechanism for data transfers. But it will still also cover. Um, Mm -hmm. larger companies who tend to use the standard contractual clauses and we're going to be working with companies to in the under a future adequacy determination transition their commitments from privacy shield to sort of the new data privacy framework mm -hmm. um i'm going to close with a quick fire round i asked the, the commissioner what what score he would give to the framework withstanding a um a legal challenge he gave seven or eight out of ten um what are your scores If I'll I'll start. If the court uh, fully implements uh, the concept of uh, fully, I mean, if they if they focus on essential equivalence, as the commissioner was pointing out, and they understand the constraints that we're operating under under, under the U.S. legal framework, I think it's a nine or ten. Whether or not that's going to happen is, of course, up to those independent judges. And so I I don't think I can actually predict where they are where they're going to come out. Nine or ten. Can you top that, Bruno? <laughs> uh, given a different answer than, from the, than the one of the commissioners that uh, jokes about. I think that what the commissioner uh, said is that I mean, it's not for us to predict or speculate on what the court uh, uh, will, will say. If, 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 we are, if we have negotiated this deal, if we are going to propose an adequacy decision, it's, it's, it's because we're confident that we can, we can credibly defend it uh, against the requirements set in, in Schrems 2. And that's what is important, and I don't think a number can be given to that. Uh, I'll put you down for a seven or eight out of ten, then. <laughs> well, that's a little uh, unfair because uh, your boss already gave uh, gave a number, so you can't you can't disagree with him. <laughs> uh, in Luxembourg, uh, who uh, maybe would have to uh, pronounce themselves uh, on that. It's, it's for them to to give a number, not for us. Alex Greenstein. Yes, I mean I would have to say like I know again sort of like you know with sort of the same like you know commentary or qualifications as sort of like Alex Joel like brought up I would say probably like you know an eight or nine. I mean I do think that sort of this is a really uh, substantial thing that moves the ball forward and we've been really forward leaning on it. But um, certainly yeah I mean it's um, you can't make sort of firm predictions about sort of um, how a court will view things. But I can say that I think this really does give us a strong basis for um, the United States and the European Commission to dissent, defend this um, agreement. And so we're, that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think we're out of time. I'd like, sorry, Bruno, did you want to say something? No, I don't okay. It was something which was very important. With the Schrems 2 judgment, we had a set of requirements. So that confidence is also given by the fact that the court indicated to us what are the elements 
uh, we needed to to develop in 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 in, in such an arrangement, and uh, and that uh, was, well, as you said, the difference uh, between the Schrems one judgment uh, and and the Schrems two uh, uh, judgment, and it, it is against those requirements that we have negotiated and and, and concluded this this arrangement. But mm-hmm. That's also why we we can uh, with with confidence uh, say uh, come to the conclusion. Um, well, thank you, thank you to the two Alexes, uh, to you, Bruno. It's been a great discussion. Uh, you all seem very confident about um, this new framework. I wonder what Max Schrems would have said if he was on this panel, uh, but that's for another day. Um, thank you to the three of you. Um, and uh, just before we wrap up, uh, I'll give you the results of the uh, poll, um, which was presented by Sipple, our partner for this. Uh, this this session today and the question was how would a renewed legal challenge affect your organization's decision to rely on the new framework and in the lead with 29 percent is i am unsure whether a legal challenge will be successful but our organization intends to rely on the new framework nevertheless well i think that's a vote of confidence if if nothing else um i've been vincent manacle thank you very much for watching today bye-bye This is an an age of disruption, of profound revolutionary change. What we're really asking ministers is to empower the ambassadors. The only thing that you really push forth is the truth. You don't see many women represented when it comes to the decisions as to how to handle the pandemic. Mm